Thank you for watching this teaching video from Oak Tree Community Church in South Bend, Indiana. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. Our mission is to help people come to know Jesus better and love Him more every day. We believe that this will not only help our own spiritual growth, but also help us better influence our communities and world for Christ. For more information about Oak Tree, please visit our website at oaktreechurch.com where you'll find past message series, online giving options, and more information about our discipleship process we call The Path. We'd love to hear from you in the comments or through our website contact form. Now please enjoy this message. And we've been talking a lot about worldview as we're working our way through Zechariah because there, there aren't a ton of direct applications as far as, you know, uh, what Zechariah is talking about, the prophecies are about Israel and stuff. And so sort of wrestling, there may have been some weeks throughout this series, you're like, I'm not really, why are we doing this? It's just information. It's a worldview thing. It's remembering of who God is and what He's doing in this world, even though things don't always look like they should. And that's why it's good to go through books like Zechariah. And remember that God is a God who is great, he is good. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 9. And um, uh, and again, I'm, there's information in here, and you're like, this is information I don't need, or I don't really want filling up my head. I've got other, other things that are supposed to be in my head. That's fine. We're still going to walk through it, and if you never remember you know, all of the details, I'm going to show you maps. Yay, maps! Uh, if you don't remember all of the maps, that's fine. But as long as we come back to the big picture, the worldview, what God is saying, this is really cool, what God is saying is, this I will do. And when God says that, you can take it to the bank, right? You can count on it. That's what we're trying to remember. That's what we're trying to build in ourselves so that when we're going through the hard times, that's our default, we want that to grow in us in such a way. We want, we want um, uh, as we're walking on the path, we want to be able to get to the point where our default is God is good all the time. Not things are bad, I wonder where God is. Right? Okay, that's the default that we're looking for. So as we go through Zechariah chapter 9, um, um, we'll, just, we'll just pick up uh, right at the beginning here. And uh, what I'm going to do is... Um, uh, go. F uh, I'm just going to read straight through verses, uh, 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 chapter nine, verses one through eight, and we'll start there. Okay, and then um, uh, I'll show you some cool maps. Uh, verse, <laughs> verse one: An oracle of the Lord, of the word of the Lord, concerning the land of Hadrach, with its focus on Damascus. Here's the here's the oracle. Here's the the message. The eyes of all humanity especially of the tribes of Israel, are toward the Lord, as are those of Hamat also, which adjoins Damascus, and Tyre and Sidon, even though, um, or although they consider themselves to be very wise. In fact, Tyre built herself up uh, a, a fortification and piled up silver like dust and gold like the mud of the streets. Nevertheless, the Lord will evict her and shove her fortifications into the sea. That sounds like a great insult right there, doesn't it? I'm going to shove your fortifications into the sea. That just uh, She will be consumed by fire. Ashkelon will see and be afraid. Gaza will be in great anguish, as will Ekron. For her hope will have been dried up. Gaza will lose her king. Ashkelon will no longer be inhabited. A mongrel people will live in Ashdod, for I will greatly humiliate the Philistines. I'll take away their abominable religious practices. Then those who survive will become a community of believers in our God, like a clan in Judah. And Ekron will be like the Jebusites. Then I will surround my temple to protect it like a guard from anyone crossing back and forth, so that no one will cross over against them anymore as an oppressor, for now I myself have seen it. Lots of names. Good to know, let's move on, right? <laughs> if this were our soap reading, let's be honest, that's what you would do, right? Chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, blow through it. Yeah, I've heard some of those names before, and what's tomorrow, right? Just sort of move on with our day. Well, 
it's not a soap reading. This is our message this morning, so we're not going to just blow through it and move on. <laughs> there is actually some interesting uh, stuff going on in here. So first of all, um, just a reminder, these last six chapters, breaking into two parts, chapters 9 through 11 point to Messiah's first coming. Chapters 12 through 14 will point to his second coming. And um, I'll show you one way that we see that division. And I pointed out last week uh, uh, that the first and the second comings are obvious only in hindsight. Okay, Zechariah is not going to say, okay, in his first coming, here's what he's going to do. And now let's move on to his second coming. All right, where there's going to be a blending of things because the prophets sort of saw all this going on at one time. And yet God had them write things that in hindsight we look back and say, they never said it was going to happen all at the same time. They thought it was going to happen all at the same time, but they never said that it was. And then it was proven wrong. Right? They just said this will happen. And we look back and we say, okay, yeah, some of this stuff did happen and some of it hasn't happened yet. So that's a hindsight thing, and that's okay. Um, all right, cool map. All right, can everybody see the map? You probably can't see. It. So this is a map of the uh, the Middle East region, and uh, that's the Mediterranean Sea out on the, the west side. There's uh, there's Cyprus there in, in the, the, the little island, and then there's a circle around uh, this, this city called Hamath. You see that in verse, uh, uh, verse 2, right? There's that city in, in Hamath. Uh, it's in Syria, modern-day Syria, up there in the north. Uh, Israel is this tiny little sliver. Uh, we'll zoom in on it for just a second. You see Babylon off to the uh, the east. You see uh, the Sinai Peninsula, where uh, that ship was stuck in the, the Suez Canal just recently, right? That's, this, that's, that's in this part of the world, uh, between uh, the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf there. Um, and so... Uh, Hamath is, is way up north in Syria. And then we're going to zoom in a little bit and uh, just, just, I'll just show you the numbers because those are a little bit easier to see. Um, uh, the one off to the, uh, the upper right is Damascus. That's in modern day Syria. Off to the left, number two is Sidon and Tyre. Okay. Then we come down the coast. And in number three, I have circled uh, Ashkelon, Gaza. These are the names that are showing up, if you hadn't picked up on that. And then over uh, number four, it doesn't actually say Jerusalem there. Um, it says Mount of Olives, but Jerusalem is right there in number four. So here's the map of, of Israel, and here are these names. Why in the world do we care is the question that you are asking right now. You probably don't but I hope that you will in a few minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm not asking you to care right now, but as we go on, I hope that you will care. Here's why we should care. Because what God has laid out here, 200 years later, will be the exact path that Alexander the Great took as he worked through Persia, Syria in the north, in the last map, down through Damascus, through Sidon and Tyre, down the coastline, he hit the Philistine areas. There, there were five, in the, if we read the Old Testament, uh, the Philistines show up a lot under King Saul and King David, right? So you hear the, some of these cities, we haven't seen them for you know, several hundred years for the most part, uh, if we were just reading through the Bible, but Ashkelon and Gaza and Gath is there and Ekron and... and um, another one that I always forget. And there are five big cities of the, the Philistines. And so there's the Philistines area, and we read about the Philistines here in Zechariah. And then we have Jerusalem off to the east. Number four, here's what happened. Israel, Jerusalem, was such a minor, minor thing that Alexander was really not going to Alexander the Great that wasn't going to bother with them. His goal was to, to defeat Syria and that per, part of Persia in the north. He was going to come down, he, uh, beat the Phoenicians in Sidon and Tyre, follow the coastline down, hit the Philistines, and then move off into Egypt. Okay? Israel was not even going to be an issue for him. But something happened that caused him, and in fact, some historical scholars, uh, they, they reject the idea that he went over to Jerusalem at all, at least at this point. Okay, Now, I think he did. I think we, we have, uh, I'll show you uh, part of why I think that, and I think it's, it's um, uh, substantiated here 
in Zechariah chapter 9. But there was no reason for Alexander the Great, as he's conquering the world, to bother with Israel. Okay, in the year 333 or 332 B.C. It just wasn't an issue. They were a nobody nation at that point. And yet something happened that I think caused him to come over. And it was so out of character and so out of the ordinary, which is one of the reasons why historians say it never happened, because it did not match his M.O. One of the, one of the, the interesting things and this will show up on a slide here eventually, so I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. One of the interesting things about Alexander the Great's conquest is that it was so fast. Okay, He conquered the world in, in a, such a short time that, that, uh, that every other world empire took so much longer. And this was prophesied in the book of Daniel when Daniel saw the four animals representing world empires, the lion was Babylon, the bear was Medo-Persia, and the leopard was Alex- it was Greece, Alexander the Great. And he was a leopard with four wings, prophesying how fast he was going to take over the, the, the world. And the way he did that was because he did not stop and take over anything. He didn't stop. He went through an area, burnt it to the ground, and kept moving. Okay, sort of like the scorched earth policy that we saw in the Civil War, right? Just uh, here in the States. He just kept moving. So he did he conquer? Yes. Did he take over? Eh, not so much. <laughs> he just destroyed. He just left this destruction in his wake. And so... Uh, he was stopped a few times, you know, for, for a period. So for, for, for Tyre, he was stopped, and I'll tell you why, and, and different things. But as he's moving down the coastline here, he's just destroying things left and right. And then he got to Jerusalem, and he didn't destroy it. There's a very interesting story behind why that happened. And I want to show you that. Um, uh, the, uh, the historian, uh, the ancient historian by the name of uh, Josephus, Okay, here's what I want to show you. Let's see if we can change this over on my... There we go. All right, so there's Josephus. And uh, this is what he said. Um, uh, Josephus was a Jewish historian, wrote about 100 years, uh, or AD 100. Okay, now, just tell you this right now. You may have heard his name before. He's not exactly credible all the way across the board. He does tend to extend the truth, shall we say, okay, often in favor of Israel. (laughs) So, all right, so uh, this is not scripture by any stretch of the imagination, but most of what Josephus says at least has a kernel of truth in it, if not, you know, straight up truth. So, we'll just see what's, what's going on. So, he has a book called Antiquities of the Jews, just the, the, the ancient, the, the, the history of, of the Jews. And this he says, about this time, it was uh, Darius heard how Alexander had passed over the Hellespont. He's coming out of Greece into Turkey, okay? And he's moving across Turkey, headed toward Persia in Syria. And then what will happen is he'll go south like on our map. He had beaten his lieutenants, uh, that's Darius, uh, Darius' lieutenants at the Battle of Granicum, you don't care about that, was proceeding farther, whereupon he gathered together an army of horse and foot and determined that he would meet the Macedonians before they should assault and uh, conquer all of Asia. So that's northern Greece and over into Turkey. So he passed, uh, and, and Syria, so he passed over the river Euphrates, that's Darius, came from the, the east, came west to meet Alexander and try to stop him before he gets into his empire. Passed over the river Euphrates, came over to to, uh, Taurus, the Cilician Mountain, and at Issus, this is a major historical battle. You can you can confirm this in all of the you know trustworthy histories or whatever. At Issus of Cilicia, he waited for the enemy, and he was there to give him battle, upon uh, uh, which... uh, Sanballat was glad that Darius was come down and told Manasseh that he would suddenly perform promises to him. Basically, what happened was this. Okay, I started reading earlier than I was going to. So, uh, <laughs> we're supposed to go down a little bit. Um, basically, what happened was this. Israel is still, is still being occupied by Persia. That's Darius. Okay, And so Israel is paying tribute and taxes and everything to Persia. And what happened was... Uh, uh, this guy Sanballat up in, in Damascus area in, in, in Syria and in, in the north 
promised Israel that if they would continue to support Darius, Persia, that you'll be taken care of. Greece won't bother you. That's the setting. Okay, Keep paying Persia and then we'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. Um, well, turned out what happened, um, the event, verse, uh, not <laughs> verse, uh, number 316 up there, the event proved otherwise than they expected. Uh, for the king joined battle with the Macedonians and was beaten, lost a great part of his army, Persia lost. His mother also, his wife and children were taken captives and he fled into Persia. So here we go. This is where I wanted to pick up anyway. Alexander came into Syria, took Damascus, number one, up there. And when he obtained Sidon, popped over there to the coast, number two, uh, he besieged Tyre, which is down in the, still in the number two circle there. And here's the thing with Tyre. Tyre was a fortress in the Mediterranean Sea. It was about a half a mile out on an island. Hard to get to, number one. If you got a, cal a, a, a cavalry, right? You're not going to take Tyre. If all you've got is infantry, not going to take. It takes a navy, okay? Something that uh, Alexander did not have a huge navy. He was doing most of his stuff on foot. Tyre had been unbeatable for centuries. But in Zechariah 9, verse 3, God says, Tyre built herself up like a fortification piled up silver like dust and gold like the mud of the streets. Nevertheless, the Lord will evict her and shove her fortifications into the sea and she will be consumed by fire. For the first time in centuries, 200 years after God told Zechariah this, Alexander besieged. He was able to surround Tyre, cut her off from everything, as if an island's not cut off enough, cut her off from everything and in two months he beat Tyre. Never anyone could imagine that 200 years earlier, God told Zechariah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. God used Alexander to, the Great to fulfill his prophecy in this part of the world. Okay? Now, even if you're not a history buff, that's pretty cool. Right? <laughs> even if you don't like history, that's pretty cool. Continuing with our good friend uh, Josephus here. <clears throat> uh, besieged Tyre. He sent an epistle to the Jewish high priest... Here's where uh, uh, the next twist. To send him some auxiliaries and to supply his army with provisions. Israel, send me money. What was Israel already told? Keep funding Persia and we'll take care of you. Well, Persia has been beat. So what does the, the Jewish leadership decide to do? Are they going to fund Alexander the Great? No. They keep sending money. They say, no to Alexander, and they keep funding Persia, even though Persia was already destroyed, which ticks off Alexander the Great. So now he has to invade Israel that he wasn't planning on doing before because they made him mad. So he's going to come down the coast, hit the, the, the Philistines, and then pop over to Israel when he didn't really want to. He wanted to get on to Egypt. Um, uh, so he formally sent to Darius, he would send to him, uh, Right and choose friendship of the Macedonians, and that he should never repent of doing so. Josephus says, but the high priest answered the messengers that he had given his oath to Darius Persia not to bear arms against him, and that he would not transgress that while Darius was still alive. And upon hearing that answer, Alexander was very angry, and though he determined not uh, he uh, determined not to leave Tyre, which he had, was just ready to be taken, even though as soon as he took it, he threatened he would make an expedition against the Jewish high priest and through him to teach all men to whom they must keep their oaths. So when he had, when uh, when he had, uh, with a good deal of pains during the siege up there in number two under Tyre, taken Tyre, settled its affairs sent its fortifications into the sea and burnt it to the ground, uh, <laughs> came to the city of Gaza, followed the coastline down, defeated the Philistines, besieged both the city with him and uh, the governor of the garrison, the garrison uh, Baba Menzies, and defeated the Philistines, and then he had to come over to Jerusalem. Now, here's what's cool. Shoot down a little bit here. 
No, I'm not going to keep reading everything. Uh, seven months, I think I said two. Seven months of the siege of Tyre were over. Two months of the siege of Gaza. Sanballat died. And now Alexander, when he had taken Gaza, and really that entire area, history tells us, not just the scene, made haste to go up to Jerusalem. And uh, Jaduah the high priest, when he heard that, was in agony, go figure, right? Under terror as not knowing how he should meet the Macedonians, the, the Alexander's army, since the king was displeased at his foregoing disobedience. I love the translation of Josephus here. He therefore ordained that the people should make supplications and should join with him in offering sacrifices to God, whom he besought to protect that nation, Israel, and deliver them from the perils that were coming upon them. Whereupon God warned him in a dream, which came upon him after he had offered the sacrifice, that he should take courage, adorn the city, open the gates... That's not what you're doing when you have an enemy attacking, is opening the day gates and welcoming them in. And that the rest, everybody else, should appear in white garments, but that he and the priests should meet the king in the habits proper to their order, their priestly garments, without the dread of any ill consequences, which the providence of God would prevent. Upon which... When he arose from his sleep, the high priest, he greatly rejoiced and declared to all the warning which he had received from God according to which dream he acted entirely and so waited for the coming of the king. So here's what's happened. Alexander the Great followed exactly what God had told Zechariah was going to happen 200 years previously. Went through Syria in the north, Damascus, went through the Phoenician cities of Sidon and Tyre, finally beat Tyre, which never should have happened, except God said it was going to happen, came down the coast to the Philistines, utterly destroyed the Philistines. There never The nation of Philistia did not exist after Alexander the Great, and now he was headed toward Jerusalem. And they came up to Jerusalem expecting everything to be walled off, closed off, as many soldiers ready, armaments, the whole thing. And what he found was the city gates wide open and the priests coming out. The same people who said, no, we're not going to give you money. And so he said, fine, I will attack. These same people came walking out to him, welcoming him to Jerusalem. And now this is, historical tradition, not necessarily historical fact, but it, it fits in. So that we have to see how, you know, I, I don't know if this is true. But according to tradition, before Alexander left Greece, Macedonia is the northern part of Greece, he also had a dream. And he saw people wearing these weird outfits that he'd never seen before. And they impressed him in such a way that he was going to leave them alone. When he walked into or walked up to Jerusalem, according to tradition, what he saw in his dream were the Jewish priestly outfits that the high priest and the, and the, the priests of God in Jerusalem were wearing. And he remembered his dream back from Greece and immediately decided that that must have been a dream from God and he was not to destroy Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Now, did God give the dream to Alexander back in Macedonia and in Greece? Did God give the dream to the high priest here that says, make sure you open everything up and welcome him. Don't, don't be defensive. I don't know if he did or not. You know what I do know? I know that 200 years before Alexander literally did these things, God said exactly what was going to happen. He would take these cities in this order. He would come across um, uh, uh, Jerusalem and Israel there. Am I still on the right? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, and in verse 8 of Zechariah chapter 9, after all of this destruction, God said, I will surround my temple to protect it like a guard from anyone crossing back and forth so no one will cross over against them anymore as an oppressor for now I myself have seen it. What's interesting is that the first part of verse 8 
if it applies to Alexander, is true, and the second part has not happened yet. Okay, it's still future, because there have been oppressors stomping across the temple since Alexander's time, haven't there? The Romans did it for centuries. In A.D. 70, Rome came in. General Titus completely destroyed Jerusalem, completely destroyed the temple, and there's not been a temple standing there for now almost 2,000 years, 1950 years. And in fact, where the temple in Israel should be standing is where the Muslim mosque is standing, the Dome of the Rock. And they, the, 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 the Islamic people, the Islamic nation, claims that that piece of property, which has been God's, like forever, <laughs> since He created it, they claim that that is their property and they will not allow Jews on the piece of property at all. There are some people who think that that little piece of land is exactly the same piece in um, Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. That same mountain where Jerusalem stands, where the temple stood, was the place where long ago, before Jesus, before the Father sacrificed that son, God had Abraham sacrifice his son. And what's really interesting is that Genesis 22, that, that, that account of Abraham Offering Isaac as a sacrifice is the first place in the Bible that the word love shows up. The word love does not occur in the first 21 chapters of the Bible. You get to chapter 22, and it says that God tested Abraham's faith. And he said to Abraham, 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 here I am. And he said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, the one whom you love. That's the first time love shows up in the Bible. And offer him as a sacrifice to me on a place that I will show you. And a lot of people, myself included, believe that the place that God showed him, Mount Moriah, was later the place where Jerusalem was built and where the temple stood. Where 2,000 years later, the Father sacrificed the Son on the cross for everyone. Isn't that awesome? How God can work in human history and work all things out. The, the, the worst of us cannot mess up what God has said He's going to do. Did Zechariah know anything about Alexander the Great? Absolutely not. Did he believe that Tyre could ever fall to an invading army? Of course not. Never had been done before. And yet he wrote down the words, he, he prophesied the words that God gave him. And what do you know, 200 years later, God used an unknown 30-year-old from northern Greece to change the trajectory of the entire planet. He said, how, how did he change the trajectory of the entire planet just because he beat up on some people? <laughs> Here's how. Let's see if this is actually the next slide. Nope. Okay, important prophecies. Alexander was able to move so quickly. Yeah, I told you this because he destroyed placers uh, rather than taking them over. Tyre had been impregnable for centuries. Philistines were broken by, by Greece. This is historical fact. And Israel's peace was temporary. Hey, we covered all that already. Here's a quote for you from Warren Wiersbe. A little bit long. It takes three slides. But this is what he says because he's asking the same question that you're probably asking. Why do we care? <laughs> Why all of this concern over the conquests? of Alexander the Great. Here's why. His conquests helped to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus Christ, which is the point of Zechariah 9-11, through 11, right? The first coming. By building Greek cities, encouraging his soldiers to marry women from conquered nations, spreading Greek culture and the Greek language, he unified the known world, and when the Romans took over, they found an empire all prepared for them. And the Roman Empire built on top of the Greek Empire, which is why it wasn't the Roman Latin that became the language of the, the common person. It was Greek. It was already there. Rome just built on that. Greek was the language of literature, and our New Testament is written in the common Greek language of the people of that day. And the combination of Greek culture and Roman government 
roads, and laws was just what the early church needed for the spread of the gospel. How was Paul able to take the gospel all over the known world at that time without being accosted and mugged and everything? Uh, That was in the cities where he stopped. That wasn't on the road. Because as a Roman citizen, he had the entire Roman Empire behind him. And if anyone attacked a Roman citizen, it was an attack on the empire itself. It's called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. They built a road system. They built an aqueduct water system that that rivaled anything that had been built before. And Paul actually had roads. You think our roads are good? Say no, because they're not. Our roads are horrible, right? There are roads built by the Romans 2,000, 2,100, 2,200 years ago that are still better than the roads we have today, right? Right? They built a highway system that had never existed before, and Paul was able to hop up on the highway and shoot off to the next city. Not as fast as we do, but he had highways in Rome. And as a card-carrying Roman citizen, if anybody even looked at him sideways, he could have called the entire Roman Empire down on that person. How else could the gospel have spread so quickly in all of these countries and all of these little dialects and all these languages and all this stuff if God had not systematically for centuries now, 500 years B.C., He told Zechariah, 300 years B.C., Alexander came, 200 years B.C., we have the Roman Empire coming and building this up. So then finally when Jesus comes and when the church starts, God says, now go. And the gospel spread like wildfire. Isn't that awesome? That's very, very cool. Even to non-history people. This is very cool. Because God, when God says, this I will do, He just does. And there's nothing we can do about it. And I really, really like that. Um, Sadly, we have to move on because we can't stay in verses 1 through 8 forever. We come to the verse, uh, verse 9, which is one of those clear prophecies I showed you last week. Clear prophecies um, from uh, uh, the first coming. Uh, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. Legitimate, victorious, humble, riding on a donkey, on a young donkey, the full of a female donkey. Of course, we look at this as the triumphal entry, Jesus riding into Jerusalem at the beginning of Passion Week on his, on, on his donkey. What's interesting is that the donkey was a royal symbol of peace. Some people think, oh, you know, Jesus was riding on a donkey. That doesn't have any royalty attached to it at all. He must not have been coming in as king or the kingdom or anything. He was still showing himself to be who he was. He had claimed to be the Messiah for his entire ministry. He had offered the kingdom and they rejected it. But when he came in riding on a donkey, not only did he fulfill verse 9 here, but the reason it fits so nicely is because in verse 10 we'll see a change to war where a king is its still the king. The donkey was a symbol of royalty, was a symbol of leadership. We can go to the book of Judges and we see some of the judges riding donkeys as they were judging and ruling over the land. Solomon. And one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, sort of cross references or comparisons, when Solomon was crowned king, he didn't come in on a war horse. He came in riding on a donkey because the donkey was the symbol of peace. And David was a warrior king, and Solomon would be a peaceful king. And when he rode into town riding on the donkey, he said, "I am coming as king, but I'm coming as a peaceful one." And when Jesus, a thousand years later, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, he was saying, you've rejected me as king, even though that's who I am. But I'm not coming to judge right now. I'm coming to bring peace. Well, what peace did Jesus bring? He entered peacefully, 
and he made peace. And I love this phrase because this shows up in the Apostle Paul in a couple of different places. He made peace through the blood of the cross. That's what he did. In Ephesians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 1, the blood of the cross brought peace. Now, uh, 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 warfare peace, physical peace, no, spiritual peace, a peace that is not accessible in any other way. Jesus entered peacefully and he was executed and he went through the whole thing. We, we, we cover this you know, every year as we see what he did through Passion Week there and the things that he suffered, but he did it peacefully. We go to Isaiah chapter 53. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and he did not even open his mouth. Not to defend himself, not to do it. There were a couple of times the gospel writers tell us he was asked a very specific question and he gave a very short answer, but he was not there to defend himself. He was not there to judge them. He was not standing there as king. He was standing there as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and he brought peace, just like riding on the donkey says, through the blood of the cross. The triumphal entry, we call it that, from a historical, physical perspective, was anything but triumphal. From a spiritual, from God's perspective, it was as triumphant as it could possibly be. Jesus won that day when he died on the cross. And then he rose again. Notice, is this on the next one? Yes. Notice the next time Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He's not been in Jerusalem again since that day. Next time he comes to Jerusalem, he will be riding a war horse. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven open, John said. And here, come, or here came a white horse, and the one riding on it was faithful and true, and with justice he judges and goes to war. There's no donkey here. <laughs> There's no peace here. Next time Jesus comes to Jerusalem, he's coming as a warrior king. His eyes are like a fiery flame, and there are many diadem crowns on his head. He has a name written that no one knows except himself. That's really cool. He's dressed, dressed in clothing, dipped in blood. There's a reason why we have to go to um, uh, Isaiah 63 to find out why that is. And uh, we're not going to do that, but if you want to look at Isaiah 63, we'll see why his clothing is dipped in blood when he comes to Jerusalem. He's called the Word of God. The armies that are in heaven, dressed in white, clean, fine linen, were following him on white horses. Verse uh, 15, from his mouth extends a sharp sword, so that with it he can strike the nations. He will rule them with, a, with an iron rod. That comes from Isaiah, that comes from Psalm 2. He stomps the winepress of the furious wrath of God. Isaiah 63, the all, uh, God the all-powerful. He has a name written on his clothing and on his thigh. Finally, one day, he will be called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's not his function right now. He is conceptually, he is his uh, prophetically, but right now he's not ruling and reigning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he will, he will one day. He will come like a warrior. And what's interesting is that in Zechariah chapter 9, we go from the donkey in verse 9 to the war horse. In verse 10, I'll remove the chariot from uh, Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem. There won't be any war anymore. The battle bow will be removed. And then he will announce peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the end of the earth. What's really cool, I've got it in italics there just because I think it's so cool and I didn't know another way to make it look cool on the slide, is that the entire church age is tucked away, hidden between verses 9 and 10. Remember, the church is a mystery in the Old Testament. They didn't know anything about it. In verse 9, Jesus comes as on the donkey and He dies. In verse 10, He comes as a warrior and He judges and He rules and He reigns. And tucked away inside between those two verses are you and me. The Zechariah didn't know anything about. And that's okay. Because if nine happened, literally, 
physically. In fact, uh, look at just some of the language there. He's, he, uh, 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 he talks about nations, announce peace to the nations. He, his dominion will be from sea to sea. He talks about the Euphrates River. These are literal, physical places. Things, right? This is not a spiritual thing. Oh, well, spiritually from the Euphrates River. What, what does that even mean? What's a spiritual Euphrates River, right? There is a Euphrates River, okay? There are sea to sea, you know, not spiritually sea to sea, but from sea, there will be peace all over this entire earth when Jesus finally comes. It has to, we, we cannot, we can't look at verse 9 and say, well, yeah, I mean, that one's, that one's literal. I mean, we can look back at history and see number 9's literal, but number 10 is spiritual. That's what's happening right now. Jesus is ruling over the entire world from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River. I'm telling you, if Jesus is ruling right now in the Middle East from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean, He's doing a bad job. Of all the places on the planet that should not describe Jesus' rule and reign is the Middle East. I mean, come on. If, that's where he, if that is where He is reigning... King of kings and Lord of lords is not a good descriptor because he's just a bad king. Can't keep his subjects under control. That's not a spiritual rule. This is a literal thing. And one day, all of this stuff in the Middle East, all those, this, this, the, the Gaza Strip and, and, and uh, um, all of the stuff that we see in the news, one day, we'll never hear about again. Never hear about. Because Jesus will rule. Now, the last few verses are just uh, a um, sort of a summary of how this is going, what's going to happen. We can go through this very quickly. In verses 11 through 13, eventually Israel is going to overtake the whole world. And again, it seems like that's such a stupid thing because Israel hasn't been able to take care, you know, overtake their own land, much less the entire world. But when Jesus comes as King of Israel and King of the world, He'll be able to do it. Verses nine or, um, 11 through 13. Moreover, as for you, that's Israel, because of our covenant relationship secured with blood, I will release your prisoners from the waterless pit, which is great, uh, sort of a, uh, a nod to Joseph. Remember what Joseph's brothers did to him? Threw him into a dry well cistern before he sold them off. Uh, sold him off. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners, with hope. He's going to release the prisoners. We see some of these same things in Isaiah 61. Today, I declare that I will return double what was taken from you. I will bend Judah as my bow. I will load the bow with Ephraim, my arrow. So we've got both sides, both the, nor the, the southern Judah and the northern kingdom if Ephraim uh, of Israel. Stir up your son Zion against yours, Greece. Hint, hint, what might he have been talking about in those first eight verses? You think maybe it was Greece? Is that cool? Sort of ties that back around here. Verse 13, even Greece, who came down and just torched everything under Alexander, one day Israel will beat Greece. And I will make you, Zion, like a warrior's sword. And then the question, verses 14 through 17, when will this happen? Well, when the Son of Man comes back. When the Son of Man comes back. Then the Lord, verse 14, will appear before them and His arrow will shoot forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet, will sally forth on the southern storm winds. Uh, I've got several passages on the slide there for you. Matthew 24 talks about the Son of Man coming in the clouds and the sign of the Son of Man and like lightning flashing across the sky from the east to the west and the trumpet and the angels will gather God's elect. It's talking about Israel, the nation of Israel. Gather them together and He will begin to judge. He will judge Israel. He'll judge the nations. Psalm 2 talks about ruling with and breaking the nations with an iron rod, shattering them as if they were nothing but clay pots if they rebel against Him. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Um, I'm going to show you this and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll finish. 
This, this, is, this is the place where we find the term Son of Man. Why did Jesus keep calling Himself the Son of Man? Every time He did it, it was a claim that He was the Messiah that he is going to rule one day. Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And, and, and with the clouds of the sky, one like a son of man was approaching, and he went up to the ancient of days. And this is a term that shows up just a couple verses earlier. God the Father, just this is Jehovah. This is, this is the God that Israel worshipped. And the Son of Man walked up to the Ancient of Days. Who does that? And was escorted before Him, and to Him was given ruling authority, honor, sovereignty. And all peoples and nations and language groups were serving Him. Does this sound familiar? (laughs) Anything else that we've been reading? His authority is eternal, will not pass away, and His kingdom will not be destroyed. And what will it be like in Israel at that time? Look at the descriptions here in verses 14 through 17. Let's see. I guess I didn't put them on a slide. I um, thought I was going to. Um, verse 14, the Lord will appear above them. His arrow shoot forth like, like lightning. Uh, Verse 15, the Lord who rules over all will guard them. Still talking about Israel. They will prevail and they'll overcome with sling stones. They will drink and will become noisy like drunkards, full like the sacrificial basin or the corners of the altar. What in the world is that? It says that the, the victory is going to be so final that the Israeli warriors will be like drunk in celebration, except it'll be to use the the phrase, it'll be drunk on the blood of their enemies. The sacrificial basin was where the blood was caught when the sacrifices were, were slaughtered. Animals were slaughtered for sacrifices. They will be drunk on the blood of their enemy. Not that they're going to drink it, but they're going to be so celebratory because of the complete and utter destruction of their enemies. On that day, verse 16, the Lord their God will deliver them as a flock. So he, 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 he calls them warriors. He calls them his flock, uh, the flock of his people. They're precious stones of a crown. God is just throwing out all of these different ways to describe Israel. Like a crown sparkling over his head. How precious and fair. Then he says, this is what's going to happen. And this will take us just one verse into chapter 10. It's a weird chapter break. Grain will be made. Uh, grain will make the, the young men flourish. New wine the young women, and ask ask the Lord for the rain in the season of the late spring rains. The Lord who causes thunderstorms, He will give everyone showers of rain and green growth in the field. It'll be an unparalleled time of prosperity for the nation of Israel and for the other nations who will submit to Jesus as King. Why do we spend time on all of this detail and all this stuff? I've said this before. Prophecy, I didn't make this up. I don't remember who said it. I've heard it many, many times. Prophecy is just history that's written in advance. Just like you can't change history, you can't change prophecy because God said, this I will do. And He has to do it or else He's a liar. So then the question is this. If God can tell Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, all right, my tongue's tired. If God can tell Zechariah details about events that happened 200 years later, 500 years later, and we look at that and say, yay God, look at what God did. Look at all these big things. He can, he can rule an entire world. He can make Alexander do these things. Do we trust Him to know and take care of us today? In our little part of the world? In our little things that we do? We trust God for prophecy. We trust God for history. We trust God for eternity. Do we trust God for today? He's a good, good Father. He's a great God. We sang it this morning. We celebrated what's happening in North Carolina. We see that there's bad stuff happening with Christians all over the world. And when we have good days, we love to sing. And when we have bad days... Well, we love to complain, don't we? God says, I want to hear you sing on those bad days too. I want you to remember that if I can 
change the course, historically, humanly speaking, if I can change the course of the world because one guy decided to conquer the entire planet by burning it all down, <laughs> you don't think I can take care of your day-to-day -day stuff? See, this is our worldview. How do we view this world? How do we view our lives? Do you think God can take care of that? I think He can. I know He can. It's just a matter of trusting Him to do it in the moment, right? In the moment. It's great to look at history. It's great to look at prophecy. But that's not where we live. We live here. Those things help us live here. That's why we study this type of stuff.